Abbott, what time is it? It's time for the Abbott and Costello Show. We're on the air for ABC here in Hollywood. Well, what are we waiting for? Let's go with the Abbott and Costello Show. Yes, it's the Abbott and Costello Show. Produced and transcribed in Hollywood for your listening and laughing pleasure. Chuckles with a carload and music by Matty Malnick. So hold on to your chairs, folks, for here they are, Bud Abbott and Lou Costello. Hey! Abbott! Here I am. Where have you been? Well, I had to take my Uncle Mike out to the rest home, Abbott. He's in bad shape, really. He thinks he's a rabbit. He keeps hopping up and down. He thinks he's a rabbit? Yeah, and I humored him. I, I hopped up and down with him, because I can hop harder than him. You can? Why? Well, I'm a kangaroo. I... <laughs> Stop this silliness. Your whole family is a bunch of ignorant, uneducated nitwits. Well, it isn't my fault, Abbott. You see, we lived in a poor section of Patterson, right next to the Patterson Laundry. In fact, every day the laundry hung their wash on the line. So what? Until I was 21 years old, I thought the sun had a flap in it. <laughs> Never mind. What have you got in that package? Yeah. It's a statue of General Grant. Uncle Mike brought it home with him last night. Why, why is the statue of General Grant broken in a thousand pieces? Uncle Mike had a fight with him because he wouldn't take his hat off in the house. <laughs> your, your Uncle Mike is a pretty stubborn man, isn't he? Yes, I guess he inherited it from his father. You mean your grandfather was a stubborn man, too? Yeah, one time a steamroller was coming down the street and Grandpa wouldn't move out of the way. The steamroller kept coming, but he wouldn't move. And what happened? You know that long, thin rug we have in the bathroom? <laughs> <laughs> what did you talk sense? Did you get yourself a job yet? Yes, I started to work on a burlesque show yesterday selling popcorn, but I got fired. How come? Some guy in the audience yelled, Take it off! And I thought he was talking to me. <laughs> so what happened? What happened? Now, now, now you are talking to Bubbles Costello. Oh, get him out. <laughs> and there'll be much more of that terrific Abbott and Costello humor in a few seconds. After we hear a special message from this gentleman. last night. Well, I had a day with our secretary, Viola Vaughn. She took me to the Palladium and she wouldn't dance with me. Then she took me out to the house of Murphy for dinner, but she wouldn't eat with me. Well, if she, she wouldn't dance or eat with you, what did she take you for? $35. I... <laughs> Throwing your money around like that. You ought to be ashamed of yourself. Right now, I need $75 and I don't know where to get it. Why, Abbott, you must have a hundred friends that would loan you $75. Well, how about you loaning it to me? Abbott, you must have 99 friends that would loan you $75. <laughs> I ought to know better than to ask a stupid, ignorant dope like you for money. Ah, 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 ah. Just a second now. Just a second. Don't call me stupid and ignorant. I'm a college man. For years, I went to Stanford University in the morning and UCLA in the afternoons. Uh, you dummy. Stanford is in San Francisco and UCLA is in Los Angeles. Now, how could you go to both of them at the same day? Being an honor student, I had a long lunch hour. <laughs> <laughs> honor student. How did you ever get to be an honor student? Well, I took the brain of a monkey and I put it in the head of a man. And today that man is alive and can talk. What does he say? Hey! Abbott! 
I thought so. You've never been in a college. And I doubt if any of your family were ever in college. Is that so? My brother Pat spent four years at the medical school at the University of Michigan. What was he uh, studying? Nothing. They were studying him. I... <laughs> Never mind that. Our new picture, Africa Screams, is coming out, and it's our business to see that everybody goes to that picture. Oh, yes. I, I agree with you. Uh, but what are you doing about it, Abbott? Well, I've got a battery here in my pocket. I press a button, my shirt front lights up and says, See Africa Screams with Bud Abbott. It's the newest thing. What's new about seeing Bud Abbott lit up? I... <laughs> ah, never mind. I understand your Aunt May is making you a new suit to wear to the preview of our picture. Yes, yeah, she made it, but I can't wear it. The material she uses from an old awning. Well, why can't you wear the suit? Because every time the sun goes down, my pants roll up. <laughs> ah, there's no use of talking to you, Costello. I want to ask you something, Lou. Well, what makes you so dumb? I guess it's a combination of two things. What is it? Fast living and slow thinking. <laughs> Well, now, maybe you should find a nice girl and get married. It would straighten you out. Now, Viola's a nice girl, and she might like to have a man around the house. I don't think so, Abbott. I was around Viola's house last night, and she called the police. What happened? Nothing. They didn't catch me. Uh... <laughs> then what about that cute little blonde that lives across the street from you? Uh, you've known her for six years. Oh, she's cute, Abbott. Well, she's just a nodding acquaintance. Uh, what do you mean, nodding? Nodding doing. I... <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you try and find a girl like my wife, Betty? Uh, here, by the way, is a late picture of her. Look at that picture. Does she look like the mother of three children? No, sir. She looks like the father. I... <laughs> My wife is a beautiful woman, Costello. She looks like Rita Hayworth and Anne Sheridan and Ava Gardner all rolled into one. There's only one thing wrong with that. What's that? When you unroll her, she looks like Wallace Beery. I... <laughs> How dare you say my wife looks like Wallace Beery? Well, she don't look exactly like Wallace no. Beery on account of the mustache. I... Wallace Berry hasn't a mustache. No, but your wife has. <laughs> well, anyway, my wife has a very pretty face. She's got eyes as big as saucers. Yes, and underneath, she's got cups to match. Handles and all. <laughs> You're just talking a lot of nonsense. My wife has got everything. Why, when she walks down the street, men stop and take a second look. They have to. They can't believe what they saw the first time. <laughs> Come on, Spotty. Spotty, yes, sir. Hello, Uncle Lou. Hello, Uncle Bud. Well, it's Abbott's nephew, folks. Listen, Norman, you've got to stop bringing that dog to the studio now. Every week you bring him down here, you keep him in my dressing room, and he always eats my lunch. Well, now, Norman, if the dog eats Costello's lunch, then you'd, uh, you'd better not bring him down here anymore. Don't worry, Uncle Louie. My dog won't eat your lunch anymore. I fixed that. Oh, you did? What did you do? I put a sign on a lunchbox that says... Lou Costello is the greatest comedian in the world. Even a dog couldn't swallow that. <laughs> Abbott, you've got to stop your nephew from buying those used jokes from Honest John. <laughs> you know, that Norman is the sneakiest guy in the world. Uh, what do you mean he's sneaky? Last night, I, I sat behind him in the movies. Yeah. He was sitting next to a strange girl. And as soon as the lights went down, what do you think he did? He put his arms around the girl. Worse than that. Uh, you mean... Yep. The minute the lights went out, he tried on her shoes. <laughs> <laughs> At least Norman is popular with girls. He doesn't go chasing after new ones every day like you do. Ah, yeah, but I don't chase girls. I've got a steady girl. I've been going with her for ten years. Every Tuesday or Thursday night I go to her house. Well, why don't you marry her? There's only one thing that stops me. What's that? Where would I go on Tuesday and Thursday nights? Well, hello, boys. Uh, hey, look, Costello, it's our, lo it's our lovely secretary, Viola Vaughn. Gee, Viola, you look beautiful tonight. How about give me a little kiss? Oh, but I've never kissed a man before. Neither have I. We can start even. <laughs> oh, I, I don't want to kiss you anyway. You're, you're too fickle. Yeah, Viola's right, Costello. All you do is chase girls. Oh, no. I do other things besides chase girls. What? Sometimes I catch them. <laughs> girls, girls, girls. Where do you think Mr. Abbott would be if he thought of nothing but girls? At the YWCA. <laughs> Costello, there's no use in your trying to make a date with me for tonight because I'm going out with Gregory Peck. Just a second, Viola. Who do you like best, Gregory Peck or me? Well, should I answer you as friend to friend, or is this on a labor management basis? 
Costello, this is ridiculous. How could you expect a gorgeous girl like Viola to go out with an ugly, fat little mug like you? I'm not so fat. <laughs> not fat. <laughs> oh, Costello, the other day when you passed the laundry, I heard one tub say to another tub, there goes the one I was telling you about that's on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> That's telling him, Viola. <laughs> All right, Viola Vaughn. I don't have to go out with you. I get plenty of girls. Every night I come home with lipstick on my collar. What's the matter? Can't you get your makeup on straight? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was a wonderful joke, Mr. Abbott. I think you're swell. Yes, I think you're swell. Oh, and I think you're swell. And I think you're swell. As soon as the swelling goes down, I'd like to say something. <laughs> Now, don't be sore, Costello. Mr. Abbott told that joke very well. Well, that's because he's had more experience in show business than you. No, he hasn't. I was in burlesque when I was only six months old. When you were six months old, you were only wearing diapers. For burlesque, do you need more? <laughs> uh, Viola, I think you'd better make up with him. I think he's getting sore. Costello, I think you're cute. Come here and put your arms around me. Viola, you... You smell so sweet. Ah. Oh. Well, it's, it's my new perfume. It's called Springtime in Paris. Oh, it's lovely. Oh. Take a whiff of this. <laughs> my goodness, what's that? Anytime in San Pedro. <laughs> As long, as long as we're so close together, Viola, why don't you give me a little kiss? Well, all right, but I'm warning you. When I kiss a man, I make his ears spin. That I've got to see. So go ahead and kiss him, Viola. Okay. Pucker up, Costello. <laughs> Costello. Costello, where are you? Costello calling airport. Costello calling airport. Clear runway number seven. I'm coming in. Now, while we take a 60-second intermission, we'd like you to consider this. Gentlemen, that singing star of the Abbott and Costello show, Hal Winter. Strange, dear, but true, dear, when I'm close to you. Stars fill the sky So in love with you am I Even without you My arms fold about you
so taunt me and hurt me, deceive me, desert me. I just got the patent on my new invention. I invented a television set with a screen te- a screen ten feet long and one inch wide. A television set with a screen ten feet long and one inch wide? Yep. Uh, what good is that? It's for people that squint. <laughs> now, television is coming up fast, Costello. Yeah, but the early morning shows won't go on television. Why not? Well, uh, you don't think that John wants the people to see what his other wife looks like before breakfast. <laughs> oh, scary luck. How about your uh, Sam Shovel detective character? Oh, that'll be a great on television, Abbott. Everybody loves me as Sam Shovel. Just listen to this fan letter I got today. Dear Lou Costello, when you come on a year with your Sam Shovel detective program, I wouldn't miss it for the world. It would take wild horses to drag me away from my radio. I'm coming over to see you tonight. Mr. Costello, is someone here to see you? Who is it? A little guy who was dragged in here by a team of wild horses. (laughs) Oh, never mind him. Uh... By the way, Lou, what is your Sam Shovel detective case for tonight? Well, Abbott, it's a very inter- interesting case. I call it the case of the pencil manufacturer whose wife pushed him into the eraser machine or she rubbed him out. <laughs> Sounds ducky. Let's do it. Let's. <laughs> and now, g- the makers of Gesundheit... The Home Remedy for Common Colds presents The Adventures of Sam Shovel, Private Detective. But first, a word about our product, Gesundheit. Friends, are you suffering from a common cold? (laughs) Take Gesundheit, and in just three hours, your common cold will be gone. You'll have pneumonia. (laughs) And remember... Gesundheit is 98% alcohol, so don't let a cold keep you from your job. Take Gesundheit. Drink a large bottle of it. You may not be the healthiest guy in your office, but you will be the happiest. (laughs) And remember this. Gesundheit, the cold remedy that is 98% alcohol, is sold with a double-your-money-back guarantee. After you take Gesundheit, if you don't see double, you get your money back. And now, Gesundheit proudly presents your favorite detective mystery, Sam Shovel, Private Detective. Yes, I'm Sam Shovel. (laughs) Sam Shovel, Private Detective. I'm sitting here in my little office. I have no chairs in my office. I've got special tables to sit on. You've probably heard of them. They're called end tables. I just finished with a big case. I caught the two Los Angeles streetcar conductors who married 15 of their women passengers. They made a movie of that case. It's called The Loves of Carmen. (laughs) Suddenly I heard a crash on the outside. I look out the window. It's a pedestrian. Knocked down by a car. He was so busy reading the safety slogans written on a curb, he didn't see the car. (laughs) I glance across the court. The beautiful stenographer across the court is walking on the ceiling of the office again. It's not her fault. Her boss keeps telling her to get on the beam. (laughs) And the detective business is pretty bad. Anybody need a detective? Anybody need a detective? I'm trying to drum up some business. (laughs) Well, while I'm standing here by the window, I might as well water my plants. (laughs) 
That's my pot of geranium. <laughs> well, I got to get to work. I'm supposed to call a stool pigeon and get some information. He should have sent it to me three days ago. I'll tell him off. Here's his phone number. Hello? A lesson, you. If you don't get that information over here right away, I'm coming over there and break every bone in your body. I'll kick your teeth in. I'll tie your legs in a knot. I'll... Do you know who you're talking to? No. I'm Schlammy, the stool pigeon. I'm six feet tall. I weigh 200 pounds. I bend iron bars for exercise. I eat nails for breakfast. I'm a cop killer. Yeah? Well, do you know who this is? No. Goodbye. <laughs> I'd better get busy on my latest case. It's the case of the mix-up of the Italian families in the maternity ward. <laughs> or which Tony had twins. <laughs> There's a package on my desk. It's some fancy pajamas I bought myself. I opened the box. Meow. They're the cat's pajamas. <laughs> It's about time for my pal, Lieutenant Abbott of the Homicide Squad, to show up. What a cop that Abbott is. He's a real bloodhound. They call him the backbone of the police department. Every time they send him out on a case, he brings back a bone. <laughs> Cops on a Homicide Squad love Lieutenant Abbott because he plays no favorites. The bookmakers love him for the same reason. <laughs> also, no winners. Abbott plays the horses the hard way. The hard way. He plays them gin rummy. As the laugh from the last joke died down, and that joke died with it, <laughs> I hear someone at the office door. It's my pal, Lieutenant Abbott of the Homicide Squad. Sam, I'm in trouble. I just had a fight with my wife, and she flew off the handle again. She's always flying off the handle. What shall I do? Try putting glue on her broomstick. <laughs> Talk sense, Sam. You know I can't afford to antagonize my wife. Her father's the chief of police, and she carries a lot of weight at City Hall. Your wife carries a lot of weight wherever she goes. <laughs> By the way, Sam, how's that case of the beautiful blonde you're trying to get a divorce for coming along? Lieutenant, I'm having in-law trouble with her. Sam, you're not married to her. How could you have in-law trouble with her? I go to her house every night, and when I try to get in, she calls the law. <laughs> cases lately, Sam? Yes, the case of Benny the Bigamist. He ditched his first wife at Pismo Beach. He ditched his second wife in Cucamonga. He ditched his third wife in Glendale. Did you catch Benny? No, I was too busy digging his wives out of the ditches. <laughs> Sam, I want you to help me on a very important case. Remember last year the department deported Bulk and Bessie? Yes, Bulk and Bessie, the beautiful Slovakian. I knew her well. Tell me, Sam, was she a Jekoslav... Or a Yugoslav? No, she was just a good-natured Slav. <laughs> well, never mind that, Sam. I just got worried that Bessie is trying to get back into this country. She's on a ship that's just coming into the Los Angeles Harbor. And we've got to stop her. Do you know anything about ships? Lieutenant Abbott, during the war, I was assigned to finding submarines in the Los Angeles River. That was a tough job. What's tough about finding submarines in the Los Angeles River? You got to dig for them. <laughs> Come on, Sam. We're going down to the dock and capture Bulk and Bessie. <laughs> Lieutenant Abbott and I arrived at the waterfront. It was dark, damp, and dirty. The tide was out, way out. I don't know how far the tide was out, but it was the first time they were running buses to Catalina. <laughs> I noticed a row of cattle ships all loaded with sheep. <laughs> Those sheep are from Australia. Ba, ba. Those sheep are from England. Ba, 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 ba. Those sheep must be from Detroit. <laughs> Look, 
here's the boat Bessie is hiding on. Lieutenant Abbott and I boarded the ship. We went directly to Bessie's cabin. As I opened the cabin door, there she stood. She was more beautiful than ever. Bessie spoke. So you come to arrest me, eh, Sam? All that we've been to each other means nothing. Nothing. You're just a copper at heart. Don't let her talk you out of it, Sam. I know she's beautiful, but we must do our duty. We're here to apprehend her. We're here to what? Apprehend her. Pinch her. You apprehend her. I'll pinch her. (laughs) Ah, It's no use, Bessie. We're cops. And we can't let you back into this country. You've got to go back. Bessie, before you go, will you give me a lock of your hair? Oh, do you want to put it under your pillow as a remembrance? No, I want to put it under my nose as a mustache. (laughs) Sam, Sam, I'm in trouble. I need strong arms around me. Talk to me, Bessie. I need love and affection. Talk to me, Bessie. To get back into the country, I need $5,000. Talk to Abbott, Bessie. (laughs) Enough of this nonsense, Sam. Bessie... I'm putting these handcuffs on you. Oh! Never mind. Now these leg irons. Oh! Now we got her, Sam. She can't get out of there. She can't even move. Are you sure? Positive. <laughs> then there's only one thing left to do. What? Come on, full speed ahead, anchors away. <laughs> In just a moment, folks, after a little advice from this one. Costello, we're a little late, so you better say thanks to this lovely audience in the studio and to all the swell people who are listening in the, at home. Thanks for listening, folks. And I would like to thank the people that help us bring you this show every Thursday night. Our writing staff is headed by Eddie Foreman with Paul Conlon, Pat Costello, Martin Ragaway, and Leonard Stern. And thanks to Maddie Malnick and all his boys and our vocalist, Hal Winters. And thanks also to our producer, Charles Vander. We'll be back again at the same time next Thursday. Good night, folks. Good night to everybody in Paris. Good night. <laughs> Listen each Thursday night at this time for another great Abbott and Costello show. This is transcribed in Hollywood. Be sure to stay tuned for the outstanding entertainment which follows throughout the evening on this ABC station.